Dark Souls 1 is a fantastic game. It's got a wonderful story that would set in motion numerous events that would occur throughout the trilogy, but with just within the bounds of its own game, Dark Souls 1 has some incredibly deep and rich lore filled with some of the greatest backstories this series has to offer, and today I want to discuss why. So without further ado, let's get started. So the opening cinematic of Dark Souls 1 starts with the Grey World, one that is filled with giant trees and dragons, and while the world stayed like that for a while, one day fire was born. As for how this fire came to be, well, it's never explained. This is one of the many things we just have to accept. The world of Dark Souls is fantasy, and many things just can't be explained. It's never mentioned how the first flame was created, as it just happened. But because the first flame was born, disparity came with it. Life and death, heat and cold, and light and dark. This description is literal. Since the first flame was created, the people of the world felt its warmth and understood what heat was. When they walked away from the flame, they realized its heat didn't reach them, which created the feeling of cold. The discovery of fire during the Stone Age is to this day the greatest discovery known to man, and in Dark Souls, this is no different. Given how unique something like this in the world of Dark Souls was, those who discovered it were obviously attracted to its power. Four notable people would discover Lord Souls next to these flames and be given immense power. These people were Nito, Isolith, Gwyn, and the Pygmy. From the intro, we can infer that there was a civilization of people that existed during the Age of Ancients. Isolith had daughters that were with her when she found her Lord Soul, and Gwyn had his knights with him, implying that people did exist during the time of the Age of Ancients, but weren't of much value to the world given how powerful the dragons were. Eventually, Nido, Isolith, and Gwyn would band together and use their power to overthrow the dragons. Gwyn used his lightning, Isolith used her flames, and Nido used his death and disease. They also received help from a Seath the Scaleless, a dragon who betrayed his own kind. Now that the new lords were on top of the food chain, the Age of Ancients was no more, and the Age of Fire had begun. This period would last thousands of years, until we get to today. Currently, the fire is fading, and it needs to be rekindled in order to keep it lit. But doing this is not as simple as it sounds. You may have noticed I forgot to talk about the Pygmy. Well, the Pygmy had a unique soul, called the Dark Soul. Using his soul, he created something called humanity. He would then share this humanity with his people. These Dark Soul-imbued people became known as humans. The Pygmy is essentially our ancestor. Gwyn feared this power, though, and created the Dark Sign, which inadvertently caused the Undead Curse. This isn't explained much in Dark Souls 1, but it is by far the most important plot in the whole series. And while I just wanted to talk about this game for the whole video, this needs to be explained or else the rest of the video going forward will make no sense. The Undead Curse, the Dark Sign, and the Fading of the Fire are all linked. The Dark Soul gets more powerful the closer the fire is to fading, thus meaning humans should get more powerful over time. But Gwyn screwed humanity twice, by rekindling the flame, thus removing our chance at power, but also by branding humans with the Dark Sign. Think of this as a literal wall of fire that prevents the Dark Soul within men from getting too powerful. The Dark Sign only activates when the flame is fading, because that is when the Dark Soul within men starts to grow stronger. This Dark Sign also prevents humans from dying, but it also causes them to go undead. These fleshy creatures were once undead humans, but they have crossed the barrier of no return. Even though humans are able to revive after death, eventually this will cause them to lose their humanity, lose their minds, and lose their purpose, causing them to go hollow. These creatures are hollows, beings who don't even remember who they are, where they are, or what they're even doing. Gwyn likes being on top, and he fears the day that he will lose his power, so he'll do anything he can to prevent that from happening. He did this by branding humanity with the dark sign, but by also rekindling the flame, which is known as the first sin. See, the world is like a set of operations. Things are born, but eventually they'll die. But then more things will be born, only to die soon after. That's just the way the world works. But Gwyn broke the laws of the world by rekindling the first flame. It was meant to be extinguished, but due to Gwyn wanting to hold on to what he held dear, he couldn't dare see it go. He sacrificed himself by using himself as kindling for the first flame. Since he had one of the four original Lord Souls that came from the first flame, it was deemed sufficient enough to be used as fuel, and thus the Gage of Fire continued. But as we know, it is fading once more. The Undead Curse is back, humans are turning hollow, and the world is in chaos. Doesn't this sound like a fantastic story? That's because it is. This intro and even the game display a sense of desperation within our characters. How far are people willing to go to get what they want or keep what they have? And while each of their desires is different, it always comes out the same. Dark Souls 1 is just the start, but the actions of its characters will continue to echo throughout the entire trilogy, and we're just getting started. After the opening cinematic, we get to see the state of the world as it is today, or at least the state of this prison. We're an undead that is sitting in their cell awaiting the end of the world. 
but one day we're given the key to our cell and are able to leave. This person is Oscar, and he speaks of a prophecy. There is an old saying in my family, Thou who art undead art chosen. In thine exodus from the undead asylum, maketh pilgrimage to the land of ancient lords. When thou ringeth the bell of awakening, the fate of the undead thou shalt know. This prophecy also happens to be the main objective of the game, but it's only the first part. The rest we'll have to discover later. The intro of Dark Souls 1 sets up a new world by showcasing multiple important events in the world's history, and also gives us enough information to understand the basic premise of the game, while also purposely withholding some of that information to give us a reason to seek out said information. One thing we need to consider, though, is our character's motivations. Why even bother making the trip to Lordran, the Land of Lords? Well, what else is there to do? It's the end of the world, and you were just given the keys to your cell, allowing you to explore the world to your heart's content. Even if you're convinced that life is doomed and the world as we know it will disappear for good, why not make the most out of it? Have some fun, kill some hollows. It's a whole lot better than rotting in a cell. With our objective laid out to us thanks to Oscar, we can now set out to Lordran and ring the bells. Technically, the first area you're meant to go is the Undead Burg, but one wrong step and you can make it to New Londo. Out of all the Souls games, Dark Souls 1 will provide the best blind playthrough, as due to its connected world, players will go in different directions, which in turn will create different experiences. New Londo is actually a late game area, since the enemies here are quite strong and the boss at the end of the level is quite tough, which you may stumble upon this area by accident within five minutes of arriving. This is due in part to Dark Souls 1's level design, which may have the best level design in the whole franchise. It's been coined as a Metroidvania, a genre that started with the games Metroid and Castlevania. These games have non-linear progression, as many areas can be accessed right away, but others can't, causing the player to go around the map looking for the key, then running back to that same location. Such as this door that leads to Havel, which can only be found in the Dark Root Basin past a boss. The door is found pretty early on in your playthrough, but the key is found much later. Plus, you'll also have to remember where that key goes. You'll be doing lots of running in this game. The highlight of one of my play sessions was going from Blight Town to Andre because I forgot to ascend my weapon before a boss fight, meaning I had to take a 3 minute walk up to him, then a 3 minute walk back down. In future titles, this would be remedied by fast travel, but Dark Souls 1 doesn't have fast travel initially, and even when you do gain the power of fast travel via the Lord Vessel, it's not the typical fast travel we're familiar with, as we're only allowed to travel to specific bonfires. These decisions further immerse the player into the world as it's all one connected level, and since they're all connected, that means you can see certain levels from different places, such as Blight Town, which is visible from Firelink Shrine. So not only was the level design of each area taken into account, but also how the levels connected to one another and how this connection would affect other areas. Regardless of where you end up though, whether that be New Londo or Undead Burg, the very first enemies you'll come to see are these hollow men, like the ones back in the asylum. All the undead we see here are humans who have lost their humanity, causing them to go hollow. And now since we are human, we should go hollow too, however it's a bit more meta than that. Hollowing is a bit hard to define as everyone can go hollow for different reasons, but the two main ideas seem to stem from constant death or a loss of purpose. Given that our character is set on ringing the bells, he never goes hollow despite being undead, as he still has a purpose. Should the player quit and uninstall the game, they would lose their purpose, so permanently quitting the game is sort of like hollowing in a sense. I don't think everything needs to be explained with lore, so this is more than likely just a gameplay mechanic, but that's how I've interpreted hollowing. On our way to the Bells of Awakening, we'll come across various different locations, but sadly there isn't a whole lot of backstory involved in their creation. Locations like Undead Burg are just undead settlements, and the Valley of Drakes is just a valley filled with drakes. The only exceptions, though, are Ash Lake and Blight Town. Blight Town is next to a location called the Depths, and at the end of the Depths is the Gaping Dragon. And while an interesting boss, what's more important is the arena. We can see water coming from the Depths and going into the sewer system, which leads to Blight Town. According to various keys in the game, we can piece together that those who previously lived in the Undead Burg but were banished from the settlement were sent to Blight Town as punishment. This is reinforced by the giant door that separates the sewer system from the outside world. But this water from the sewer is poisonous. Well, in Blight Town, there's a spell called Poison Mist, and according to its description, it seems that Engi, this egg-bearing individual, may have caused this as he was the creator of the Poison Mist spell. It's not fully confirmed that he did this, but it's clear that Blight Town isn't in the greatest state. And it's due to the circumstances surrounding Blight Town that the townsfolk seem to have built above the water in hopes of getting away from it. This is a common theme in these games of things being built on top of one another, as we see Blight Town above the swamp, depths above Blight Town, and the Undead Burg above all that. The idea of pushing things down and leaving them to fester is also a common theme within this game, but not everything is in such a sad state. 
as at the lowest point of Lordran we see Ash Lake, a seemingly infinite land filled with arc trees that are surrounded by an equally infinite body of water. For the purposes of Ash Lake, this seems to be where the dragons used to live, or at least one part of it, as it's eerily similar to the environment in the intro, which we do know was the land of the everlasting dragons. We can even find one of the few remaining dragons down here in Ash Lake. He's a part of the Dragon Covenant in-game, and from various descriptions, it seems like many people worshipped the dragons and tried to ascend to their level. It's unclear, though, if that worked. Once the player feels confident in their fighting abilities, they can approach the bosses defending the Bells of Awakening, these being the Bell Gargoyles and Chaos Witch Quelag. After ringing both bells, we'll see that Sen's Fortress, a place that was originally blocked with a large gate, is now open. But if we travel back to Firelink Shrine, we'll find a primordial serpent named Frampt. He claims to be a close friend of Gwyn's, and also claims to know our fate. Very well. Then I am pleased to share. Chosen Undead. Your fate is to succeed the great Lord Gwyn, so that you may link the fire, cast away the dark, and undo the curse of the undead. To this end, you must visit Anor Londo and acquire the Lord Vessel. Just like before, this second part of the prophecy also happens to be our newest objective. But Framed is quite a complex character. If certain conditions are met within the game, we can also be granted an audience with Koth. He, however, tells us a different story. Your ancestor claimed the Dark Soul and waited for fire to subside. And soon, the flames did fade, and only Dark remained. Thus began the Age of Men, the Age of Dark. So it wasn't just the fact that the fire was fading that caused Gwyn to rekindle it, the flame actually went out. Furthermore, despite being the same species, both Frampt and Koth have different views on the world. Frampt wants to keep the Age of Fire going, but Koth wants to usher in an Age of Darkness. The question is, who do we trust? Well, that's up to you, as these are the two endings of the game. Extinguish the flame, or rekindle it. The choice is yours. What is important to note, though, is their motivations. Why are they doing this? Why are they against each other? Well, we still don't know and it's been a widely debated topic that hasn't been given a proper answer yet. Regardless, I don't think you should trust any of them. Framped claims that the undead curse will be cured if we link the flame, but this isn't correct. As we'll see in Dark Souls 2 and 3, the curse is still present. Framped and Koth are like politicians. They say what needs to be said, but never elaborate. By technicality, the undead curse will be cured when we link the flame. As we know, the dark sign only appears when fire fades, and if it's not fading, then the curse of the dark sign is gone, which means the curse goes with it. But it will eventually come back. Things are meant to run their course, so over time the fire will fade again and the curse will come back, just not in our character's lifetime. Framped, whether intentional or not, is leading the player to believe that the curse will disappear permanently, when indeed it only just disappears for a few thousand years. But Koth is also lying, as he isn't fully explaining what this Age of Darkness entails, and as we'll see, Koth isn't exactly the nicest person in the Souls universe. I've always seen these two as immortal beings, ones that are ageless, and due to this, when the time comes, they like to move the pieces a bit and see what happens. Koth and Frampt are basically playing a long game of chess, but without the stakes. Regardless of who wins, they both continue to live. One just managed to convince the chosen undead more. So, why not cause a bit of chaos? A lie or two here wouldn't hurt anybody, as it's just extra pieces on the board to them. To this day, we still don't know what they really want from us, and whether their goals they conveyed to us were actually genuine. My interpretation of these could be wildly incorrect, but that's the beauty of these games. They allow you to shape your own story and create your own adventure, and in my story, I don't trust these two. Regardless of who you believe, the one thing they agree on is that we need the Lord Vessel, thus we need to get to Anna Orlando. To get there, we'll need to pass through Sen's Fortress, a place filled with deadly traps and is easily the most infuriating area in the whole game. The fortress is also used as a sort of trial as this leads us to An Orlando, but many people have tried and failed to get there. This is of course due to the numerous traps throughout the fortress and the iron golem at the top, although he was surprisingly the easiest part of the fortress. Once the golem is defeated, we are then grabbed by these demons and taken to An Orlando.
It's hard to forget your first time in Anor Londo. Nothing up until this point has been more extravagant and beautiful looking than this place, and that's what makes it so memorable. In a world devoid of beauty and color, there's this incredible place that just exists, but it's on the other side of the wall. But something is off. It feels empty, like we showed up late to a party, and in a more metaphorical and literal sense, we have. This place is gorgeous, but if you'll excuse the pun, it's also quite hollow. Lots of your time in An Orlando is spent walking, but if you manage to make it past these giants and exploit the AI of these Silver Knights, then you'll make it to the climactic fight of Ornstein and Smo. Owen S is undoubtedly my favorite fight in Dark Souls 1. The balance of these two is unmatched, as Orenstein is a quick, nimble fighter that can go halfway across the arena just to hit you, but his damage is nowhere near as staggering as the force that is Smo. Whereas Orenstein instills fear from his speed, Smo's fear comes from his power. Ornstein at the beginning of the fight is more or less a pushover. He does deal decent damage, but it's not enough to warrant a healing item. But no amount of damage resistance, especially this early on, could protect you from Smo's hammer. And one hit from this hammer can make Ornstein seem a lot more threatening. Their power grows from the other's presence, as the more Ornstein chips at your health, the closer you are to being within one-shot range of Smo. And if Smo hits you once, well, there's nothing that can compare to that level of stress. They feed off each other in such a balanced way. In fact, they actually feed on each other, as whoever falls first becomes the power source for the other. Their health also goes back to full, so it's never about dwindling them down over time, it's committing to one and sticking with it. The problem is knowing when to strike and how. Given how well they complement each other, it might seem like there's never an opening, and that's what makes them such a difficult fight. All that's required, though, from the player is patience. It's arguably one of the best fights in the game, and even the series as a whole, and I can finally see why. While ONS may seem like the climactic finish to the level, hold your load, as behind them is the real climax, the Princess of Sunlight, Guinevere. Feel free to interpret Climax however you want. She is the one who gives us the Lord Vessel we need to progress through the game, but as I said earlier, it feels like we arrived late to a party. Well, I wasn't lying. Once the post-nut clarity settles in, if we attack Guinevere, the world of Anor Londo shows its true colors, and reveals that it's just as depressing as everything else in Lordran, and the one responsible for this illusion is Dark Sun Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn is an interesting case to me, as he was the last-born child of Gwyn, who was a male but was raised as a female. This was due to his strong affinity with moon magic. I'm not sure what the connection is, but maybe Maybe it's some sort of cultural thing, where the moon is seen as a sort of feminine symbol, which would actually explain a lot regarding a future game and two of its characters. Gwendolyn also created the illusion of Anor Londo to seemingly entice the chosen undead to continue their duty. Remember, Gwendolyn only appears when we kill Guinevere's illusion, meaning that this is actually Gwendolyn speaking to us through his sister. He also shares the same viewpoints as Frampt, which is interesting, as he's basically telling us to kill his father and continue the Age of Fire. Gwendolyn seems to want to hold on to the power his family has and keep things running running smoothly, which is why he wants the Age of Fire to continue so that his family and their powers can stay. And the reason why he created the illusion of Andor Londo was also to desperately hold on to the past. Ha, huh, I guess it runs in the family then. As for how Guinevere fits into this, well, she was Gwyn's second-born child, who, like many other deities, left An Orlando. She would then meet with a flame god Flan and later become his wife. Besides these two, Gwyn had two other children, but we'll have to wait for Dark Souls 3 to discuss more about them. So In Orlando, the city of gods, this place that was supposed to be seen as a beacon of hope to all within Lordran is just an illusion. But An Orlando isn't the only illusion of Lordran. By making our way to the painting inside the city, upon touching it, we're thrown into the painted world of Ariamis. Ariamis as a concept is fascinating, as it's this world within a world, and these people inside the painting could possibly never know of the world outside of it. From exploring this hidden world, we learn that Ariamis was made for things the gods feared. Ariamis is home to the followers of Velka, and Velka is known as the Goddess of Sin. Furthermore, this is the only location in the game where you can find the Dark Ember, which according to its item description is used to make occult weaponry, weapons that were favorable amongst those who planned to kill the gods and their kin. Velka was more than likely someone who wanted to hunt the gods but was killed or thrown into the painting. It's clear that this place has a malicious history behind it, but it's not all bad, as the person who watches over Ariamis is crossbreed Priscilla. Priscilla is a half-human, half-dragon crossbreed. Due to this unique birth, she also gains some unique abilities, mainly the ability of Life Hunt, which she uses on her scythe. These powers of hers could threaten the gods' rule, so they also threw her into the painted world. But what's rather interesting is Priscilla herself. She's the only boss in the game that doesn't want to fight us, 
She even tells us how to leave Ariamis, meaning not only does she have no intent of enacting revenge, but she knows how to leave yet refuses. Priscilla may have felt how these new arrivals feel, but instead of using vengeance, she uses acceptance, and instead welcomes these people into her painted world. It's actually quite wholesome, and is the reason why I couldn't kill her. Every boss in this game is hellbent on killing me, so when I finally discovered one that didn't want to, and in fact helped me, I couldn't refuse. So I left with the hope that Priscilla would be able to make this place a proper home for her people. This whole area is swarming with hollows and other creatures that want nothing more than to kill us, but they were either tricked into here or thrown in because the gods willed it. And yeah, some of them probably do belong in here, but if Priscilla is set on making this place a home for those who have found themselves here, then... Who am I to intervene? After acquiring the Lord Vessel, when we meet with Koth or Frampt, they'll tell us that to gain access to Gwyn, we must gather the remaining Lord Souls and use them to satiate the Lord Vessel. These Lord Souls belong to four individuals, Seat the Scalus, the Witch of Isolith, Nido, and the Four Kings, three of whom you will have already recognized. From here, we can tackle the game in any order we want, so let's start with the Four Kings. The Four Kings are, well, four kings who ruled over New Londo. They were given fragments of Gwyn's soul, which is why we need to kill them. You may recognize their boss location, as this is the same dark abyss that we met Koth in. Well, long ago, the four kings were tricked by Koth and were consumed by the abyss. This caused the kings to go mad, and this also caused the citizens to either become these blobs of mass or the dark wraith soldiers. This area really utilizes the environment to tell its tale, as this place is overrun by the ghosts of the villagers, and when we actually unlock the door to lower New Londo, we see piles of corpses scattered the the land. Koth single-handedly destroyed an entire city simply by tricking its inhabitants and unleashing the abyss upon them. While the mass extinction of a city sounds bad, there is still more destruction to be seen. One thing you may have noticed is a severe lack of human bosses. Quelag would probably count as the first one you'd meet, although she's sort of half-human, but there's a reason for this, as this has to do with the Witch of Isolith. While Gwyn was frantically running around trying to figure out what to do with the flame, the Witch of Isolith had a plan. She was going to create a new flame that would replace the first flame, but she attempted to create a replica in the presence of the very thing that was created, which brought with it massive consequences. The Witch of Isolith wanted to create a new first flame, but there was already a first flame present in the world. There can't be two first flames. Due to this, the flame that she created couldn't be contained for long, causing it to erupt, and this not only consumed her and her children, but also created new life, as it gave birth to demons. The Asylum, Taurus, and Capra Demon, roughly the first three bosses in the game, were created from this event. In fact, anything that has the word demon in it is most likely derived from this flame of chaos. But not only was new life created, old life was altered. All of Isola's family who were caught in the explosion were all transformed into demons themselves. Chaos, Witch Quelag, the Fair Lady, and Ceaseless Discharge are three of Isola's children. Just as Gwyn was desperate to continue the Age of Fire in an attempt to keep what he had, so too did Isolith, but the consequences are a reflection of her actions. In an attempt to give life to something bright and warm, she ended up giving life to something cold and dark. She also wanted to extend the Age of Fire in order to continue her prosperous life with her children, but by doing so, she ended up making their lives a living hell. Not a single person in this family tree is living a robust life anymore. Quelag and her sister, the Fair Lady, are half-demon and are more than likely suffering from their condition as told to us by the fair lady. Quelag, what is it? Quelag, my dear sister, the eggs, it hurts. They've gone still. I am afraid it may be too late. I am so sorry, dear sister. Ceaseless Discharge was covered in lava source from birth, so his life was a living hell from the start. The Flame of Chaos just made it worse. Ceaseless Discharge, just like Priscilla, doesn't actually want to fight us. It's only until we steal this clothing set that he attacks us. This clothing set rests upon a grave that belonged to his sister Quailana, who he believes died in the explosion, when in fact she was the only one who escaped. Quailana will appear in Blighttown if the player is sufficient enough in Pyromancy. Quailana explains that she was the only one who made it out of the reaches of the Flame of Chaos. In fact, she was actually able to harness the power of the Flame of Chaos and create magic, which we know as Pyromancy. Quailana wants us to fulfill her duty for her, as she does not have the strength to go on. She instructs us that we need to put down her siblings and her mother so that they may rest in peace. This whole family dynamic is horrific, as Ceaseless believes that all his sisters are dead, even though Quailana is alive. And Quailana is only a few meters from her sister, and yet we can tell her about this. 
Clearly, this is turning into a very depressing story, but it only gets worse. As we get closer to the final boss of the area, we'll meet with a pyromancer who is assumed to be another daughter of Isolith, although it's unclear why she is so far down in these ruins, yet is completely unharmed. It's possible that she, like Quailana, escaped the Flame of Chaos, but this daughter came back to finish off the boss right behind her, or has possibly gone insane and is now defending said boss. And by going down this slide, we will meet this monstrosity who is the Bed of Chaos. This is the Witch of Isolith. One of the foremost powerful people in the world has been demoted to this deformed tree-like creature. There are also these orbs next to her that we need to destroy in order to damage her, and it's assumed by many that these are her other two daughters that were closest to her when the flame erupted. So we have two daughters stuck to their mother, two daughters who were half afflicted by the flame, a son who is arguably the most affected, and two daughters who managed to survive one who doesn't have the strength to carry on anymore, and another who sits outside her mother's arena. This is by far the most depressing story I've ever had the misfortune of uncovering. The further we push into Lost Isolith, the more of the family we get to meet, allowing us to see the consequences of her actions. We can see the pain that all of them are in, as some of them are just wishing for their siblings back and others just want to stay alive. It's an awful story that all leads to the final fight with Isolith herself, and it is by far the most anticlimactic ending I've ever experienced. It is agreed upon by many that the Bed of Chaos is the worst fight in Dark Souls 1. The boss is insanely difficult, but it's not the difficulty itself that's the issue, it's why the boss is difficult. I would argue that just within the main game, the two hardest bosses are the Four Kings and Ornstein and Smoke. O and S are difficult bosses because there's two of them. You have to have both on screen at all times or you'll lose this fight. This is balanced by having Ornstein be fast but not as lethal, and Smo being slow and hard hitting. It's a wonderful dichotomy that makes for a satisfying fight. And the Four Kings a DPS check, as every 30 to 45 seconds a second king will spawn, and this will keep going until four are on your screen at once. To succeed, you need to kill the current king before this happens. Both boss fights are hard, but have weaknesses you can exploit. The Bed of Chaos has none. To defeat the boss, you need to destroy both orbs on her sides, then go down the middle inside of her so you can find the source of her power. She's actually extremely weak, as both the orbs and her die in one hit. It's getting there that's the issue. Her hand attack is oddly timed, and due to her design, it's unclear where her hip box ends. After defeating one of the orbs, the floor will start to crumble, so not only do you need to avoid her attacks, but you'll also need to avoid the floor. There's also a strict path you're meant to follow for this fight, which will lead you right next to a broken piece in the flooring, so you'll more than likely get hit and fall in and die. The walk back to this boss is also just as atrocious, as you'll more than likely spend more time walking to the boss than actually fighting her. Thankfully, there is no reset involved in this boss, as every single run you've done is carried over to the next, as it essentially has unlimited checkpoints. It's like from software knew it was bad, but still kept it in. Even if I actually enjoyed the fight, the payoff narratively isn't worth the time. We ventured further and further into the depths of Lost Isolith, coming across all of her children who were these hideous beasts that did incredible damage, and she's just a puzzle. The Witch of Isolith has one of the best backstories in the game, as the tale of her children is heartbreaking, and being able to see their conditions face to face does take a lot out of you, but it's completely soured by a boss fight that is mechanically and narratively a letdown. Our third Lord Soul belongs to Grave Lord Nido, and he He's... interesting, to say the least. Nido might have the most detailed boss design, but the most basic story out of all the four lords. If you were to just assume that Nido simply became the Grim Reaper and just administered death, you wouldn't be far off, which is a shame for someone of his importance. Gravelord Nido lives in the Tomb of Giants, which is accessed via the Catacombs. Both of these areas share a similar theme of death, as this is where the dead are buried. So we know that he administers death, but what else does he do? Well. Not much else. He does have a covenant that you can join, but their goal is just to spread more death across the world. It seems like he doesn't care about what's going on in the world, as the only reason he attacks you is because we're obviously here with malicious intent. Nido doesn't have any lore regarding his life during the Age of Fire, and it's just about him administering death. From this, we can infer that Nido either doesn't care about the Age of Fire, or maybe even just wants the Age of Darkness to occur. The only other bit of lore surrounding him is a boss named Pinwheel, who is a necromancer, presumably made up of three people, as referenced by the number of masks on the body, who stole an item from him known as the Rite of Kindling. There are quite a few theories regarding Pinwheel, like the fact that Pinwheel was originally a father, but his wife and child died, so he attempted to resurrect them, but it failed, and some of stated further that he's still trying to figure out how to revive them as we can see skeletons throughout the room which could be seen as his test subjects. But other than that, we've pretty much discussed all of Nito. There isn't anything else to speak about, which is a real shame. His backstory has a massive amount of potential, but it just felt unfinished. There are no major themes tied to Nito. He just kinda exists. Our final Lord Soul belongs to Seath the Scaleless. 
Seath, as we remember, allied himself with our four lords and attacked the dragons. The reason he did this was because Seath, unlike the other dragons, was not immortal. All the other dragons had impenetrable scales that could not be broken with any type of weapon. Seath was not born with these scales, so in a sense he was not immortal. It was only until Gwyn was given their weakness from Seath, which we know is lightning, that Gwyn was able to pierce the dragon's scales and actually kill them. Seath was envious of his brethren as they had what he didn't, so as thanks for working with Gwyn, he was named the Duke and given the Duke's archives, as well as some of Gwyn's lord soul for power. During the war, Seath found the Primordial Crystal, an item that gave him temporary immortality. But during this time in the Duke's archives, he eventually went mad with his experiments and his research. He is considered the grandfather of sorcery, as well as the creator of these creatures and the Moonlight Butterfly. Our first interaction with Seath is that he ends up killing us and throwing us in a prison cell. We can see that theme of desperation, as Seath is trying everything he can to get what he wants, but in the process it made him mad. He's not as mindful of his actions as he used to be, and is sort of a shadow of his former self. One thing I find interesting in this prison is the abundance of miracle-related items, and the clothing that are scattered throughout the prison. It's possible that clerics were deemed suitable subjects for Seath experiments. Maybe this is due to their magical power, or because they were so easy to defeat. To kill Seath, though, we need to head to the Crystal Caves, which I was originally going to say was probably the worst level in this game, due to half the map being invisible, but the walk to the boss is surprisingly straightforward. Venturing off that path, though, is where the problem lies. To defeat Seath, we need to break his primordial crystal so that we can sever his immortality, giving us a chance to kill him. The story of these lords caused a bit of an imbalance throughout my playthrough. You can go through Lost Isolith and the Demon Ruins, which is filled with rich lore, tons of backstory, and compelling bosses that fit with the lore surrounding the Witch of Isolith, but then you go to the Four Kings and just find out that they were Lords of New Londo who got tricked by Koth and consumed by the Abyss. It feels jarring going from one to the other, as one feels thorough while the other feels incomplete, like you missed something or there was more that should have been said. I don't think every boss needs to have a multi-page Wikipedia article in order for it to be considered a good story. I think that the boss's story said what needed to be said in regards to the overarching plot, but I can't lie to you and tell you that I didn't leave these locations wanting more. I wanted to know more about the Four Kings and how they rose to power, and I wanted to know more about Nido and Seath in general, but I never got that. And I guess, in a way, this could be viewed as a positive, as I didn't walk out of these places not wanting to learn them at all, but rather wanted to learn more. The game invested me so much into its story thanks to its characters and environmental storytelling that I wanted the game to provide me with more information on it. I wanted to be encapsulated by this story more than I already was. As with many Souls games, not all answers are explicitly told to us, but there were still a lot of burning questions I had that never got mentioned. With the Lord Souls in the vessel, we are now able to fight Gwyn, but we still have one final location we need to visit, which is the land of Ulysil, accessed by the Artorius of the Abyss DLC, the one and only DLC that Dark Souls 1 would have. We start this DLC by defeating this gold golem that has a woman named Dusk captured inside. Dusk was the princess of a place called Ulysil. According to her, it's a place from an age that existed long ago. Hilariously enough, she doesn't actually say anything after this. You would think that the DLC would sort of spin a story that her home is in danger and we need to save her, but she doesn't actually tell us that. She just sells us sorceries. The DLC doesn't officially start though until we return back to her location with an item called the Broken Pendant, which causes us to get sucked in into this portal and taken to to Ulysil. As Dusk said, Ulysil is a place from long ago, and while you may be confused on how this fits within the geography of Lordran, this place is a lot closer than you think. In fact, we already ran through it to get to the DLC. The Dark Rue Garden is Ulysil. This is evident by the tree enemies who have a similar design to these tree-like enemies, and the same plants that are only found in the Dark Rue Garden are also found here as well. Ulysil was a city hundreds of years before the Dark Root Garden came to be, so something happened that made this place turn into the garden that we know of. Well, to understand the story of Ulysil, we need to talk to Elizabeth. But Princess Dusk is here no longer, snatched away by that horrifying primeval human. And so I must ask, couldst thou once more play the savior? An abyss was begat of the ancient beast, and threatens to swallow the whole of Ulysil. Knight Artorius came to stop this, but such a hero has nary a murmur of dark. Without doubt he will be swallowed by the abyss, overcome by its utter blackness. Indeed, the abyss may be unstoppable. Still, I have faith that Princess Dusk may be rescued yet. This prime evil human is Manus of the Abyss, the final boss of the DLC and the thing that sucked us into Ulysil in the first place. So our job is to hunt Manus down. My main gripe with the DLC is justification, as technically with the Lord Vessel we can just leave, so 
Why do we need to worry about this? It's not an immersion breaking problem, but it is a shame. While traveling to the land of Ulysil, you will come across this coliseum like structure, which is where we get to meet our next boss, Artorius of the Abyss. Artorius was one of the four knights of Gwyn. The other three are Hawkeye Goth, who is sitting at the top of the tower right next to the coliseum, Karen, who appears in the coliseum after we defeat Artorius, and the final knight is Orenstein. Each of them were skilled in their own ways, as Hawkeye used his powerful great bow to shoot down dragons. In fact, he can actually help us shoot down Calamite, who was the last of the ancient dragons. Ornstein also used his spear that was able to cut through the scales of dragons with ease, and we can also see the spoils of his war due to the amount of dragon heads that exist in Anorlando. Artorius is also able to wield his greatsword with incredible finesse, and Kairin used her two daggers to cut down anyone who opposed Gwyn's rule. But all of them, minus Ornstein, are way past their prime, which is a growing theme amongst the entire series. Goth was imprisoned in this tower with nothing left to do but to make carvings. He also couldn't use his great bow anymore, as all the dragons have been wiped out, so he has no purpose. Kairin may have had a deep love for Artorius, as when we visit her, she is next to a grave she made for him, and asks if we can give her his soul. If we do, she gives us her weapons, and continues to sit by the grave, implying that she no longer wants to be a knight anymore. And Artorius came to Ulysil in an attempt to stop the abyss from spreading, but ended up losing and being corrupted himself. His left arm is also dangling, which might suggest that it's broken. This is because he used his shield to protect his wolf companion Sif, the same Sif from the main game, although he is much smaller in this DLC. Sif also has a different intro if you do the DLC first, because Ulysil is in the past, so he'll remember you in the present, and it makes killing him that much harder. In regards to Sif, it's possible that he doesn't want us getting the Covenant of the Abyss Ring, as that allows us to travel through the abyss to kill the four kings, and given his owner's condition, Sif probably doesn't want us to end up like Artorius. The Artorius boss fight was actually really entertaining. He was the first boss that felt like the antithesis of this game's combat. Most of the game's pace has been very slow and methodical, but he has these fast attacks and very few openers. I do wish though that there was at least an ounce of build up to this fight, as you can literally start the DLC and be at the boss room in about 10 minutes. I think having the player traverse some of the areas that are covered in these abyss creatures that grow in number as we get closer to Artorius would have been great as it's slowly leading us towards this person responsible for all this death. While narratively it felt a bit too fast for me, the fight mechanically was great. After Artorius, we can explore the rest of Ulysseo and we can see how much this land has been affected by the Abyss, as all the inhabitants have been infected by this dark energy turning them into these disgusting creatures. Eventually we'll reach the bottom and this feeling of fear starts to set in as the world becomes darker and darker the further we go down. Here in the chasm of the Abyss is where the darkness reaches its peak, and it's where these dark sprites of humanity live. These are very similar in design to the actual humanity we consume in game. This seems to be humanity in a more physical form, one that is more exposed and not constricted by the dark sign. At the foot of the chasm is our final boss, Manus, the father of the abyss. Manus has an interesting story. Apparently the people of Ulysseo were tricked by a serpent, who was probably Koth, into digging Manus's grave up. In doing so, it caused Manus to go wild and unleash his wrath upon them. According to his soul, Manus was once a human, but became father of the abyss when his humanity went wild, and now he eternally seeks his broken pendant the same pendant we had to find to start the DLC. It's unclear why he liked this pendant so much, but it was possibly nostalgic to him, or was given to him by someone he loved, and because this pendant was so important to him, he did everything he could to get it back, which inevitably drove him to insanity. It seems that he got so desperate to find the pendant that he pulled in random people into this world, as the NPC Marvelous Chester is clearly not from this world, and he even says so himself. He also kind of looks like the Hunters from Bloodborne, which is a nice reference to the game. The main question many within the community have, though, is who was man before he became his current deformed state. Well, we really don't know. Many have said it's the furtive pygmy, and I like that idea, but I think it's less interesting than that. Many of the spells in this DLC say that they were created by an Ulysselian sorcerer on the brink of madness. I can't help but think that this is perfect for Manus's description. One thing that is interesting is that in the middle of the arena is a grave with a humanity-shaped hole, so maybe Manus was one of these humanity sprites when he died, or that this is what he turned into when he died. Regardless, it's a very interesting detail. I also couldn't get any footage of this as she disappears when you leave the boss room, but Dusk apparently appears out of Manus when we kill him, meaning that he kidnapped her. This may confuse some people, as Dusk has been sort of all over the place in this game, and due to her going from the past to the present, it sort of screws with the time a bit. It seems like she was sent into our time somehow and was captured by this golem. She then disappears and goes back into her time, which then leads to the Abyss incident with the people of Ulysseel. Artorius is then called to defeat the Abyss, but fails, and then we get summoned into this world via Manus's hand, then save Dusk and go back to the present. It's still a little confusing, and the world of Dark Souls is also very confusing 
confusing when it comes to time, as always during this fading of the fire, time is very convoluted because we can summon people as phantoms and the time sort of stops. It's very confusing, but that's how I think it went down. But with Manus dead, we have officially finished the DLC. However, this won't be the last time we'll hear of Manus, but that's for Dark Souls 2. Artorius of the Abyss was a great DLC. While it does lack in motivation in regards to the player, the actual story of the DLC was great. It provides us with a nice timeline of events, as well as more insight into the Abyss and its effects on the world, and while not known at the time, it would eventually set up the plot to Dark Souls 2. It is without a doubt a worthy extension to the game's story. But now we can finally go to the Kiln of the First Flame and determine the fate of Lordran. The Kiln is coated in ash, and we can see the spirits of those who followed Gwyn into the Kiln walk around aimlessly. As we approach the First Flame, we have one person in our way, and that is the Lord of Sunlight himself. Earlier I said Gwyn sacrificed himself to rekindle the flame, and he did. But because of his Lord Soul's power, he was able to keep his body, but his mind was gone. Gwyn has gone hollow. And while I'm more than capable of killing him myself, I couldn't dare start the fight without the guy who's been by my side since the very beginning. Solaire of Astora is easily the most well-known NPC in the entire Souls franchise, and his story is a perfect representation of the mood this game is trying to convey. Throughout the whole game, we've been meeting with NPCs of all kinds, some with goals and others without, but none of them have managed to touch my heart in a way that Solaire and Siegmeier did. Both of them had a goal in mind. One wants to find his sunlight, and the other wants to explore the world, but both are stuck. Siegmeier always seems to be getting himself caught in some situation, whether that be a locked gate he can't enter or a poison swap he can't cross, and Solaire can find his sunlight. They both willingly became undead in order to achieve their goals, and it tore me apart to hear that Siegmeier couldn't see it through. Siegmeier prides himself on being a knight of Katarina, and that he can handle all of his troubles on his own, but with my help I showed him that he wasn't a worthy knight after all and that he always needed someone to rescue him. More often than not, in these games, your assistance will lead to their death, so it's either converse with them and enjoy their company, knowing that they will die because of you, or distance yourself from them, knowing that while it hurts, it's better that they get to live another day. NPCs of these games will usually end up achieving a terrible fate, but this sadness makes the few times a happy outcome occurs all the better. Solaire wasn't able to find sunlight of his own. He became depressed and wondered if this journey was really worth taking, conveying the tone of the entire game. Is our journey and our struggle really worth it in the end? End, which is why I owed it to him to make it right. It may not be the actual sun, but the first flame could be considered the sun, so for one final time I summoned Solaire and we took down Lord Gwyn. Gwyn's theme has such a fitting tune. All these bosses have these intense sounds with loud music, but Gwyn's is such a simple piano. It's not intense, it's almost sad in a way that the most powerful man in the world has been reduced to nothing, and what was supposed to be a glorious fight between two warriors really isn't. It makes it all the more worse when you realize that Gwyn can be parried, and once you nail this timing down, this fight is a cakewalk, further showing how far from grace he has truly fallen. With Gwyn defeated, we can now choose our ending, but we aren't the only one who's able to choose. Since we managed to bring Solaire all the way to the end of the game, he was able to also fight Gwyn in his own world thanks to the convoluted timelines of Dark Souls, and it is canonized that he succeeded and linked the flame in his own world. He became the sunlight he was searching for, and that might be one of the greatest endings in the entire franchise. But while Solaire linked the flame, that doesn't mean we have to. If we choose the Age of Fire, the world continues. We rekindle the flame and use ourselves as kindling to continue this Age of Fire. If we instead choose to leave, we let the flame extinguish itself. We join the primordial serpents, including Koth and probably Frampt, and usher in an Age of Dark. One where humanity is at the top and we ourselves are the ruler. At least that's what we think will happen. Like many plots in the Soul series, this is once again left up to interpretation. We only get to see the very beginning of our choice, so anything after is just pure speculation. Who knows what will happen after, and who knows if our choice was really the correct one. That's always been up to the player to decide, but I've always felt that these endings are about comfort. Do we stay comfortable knowing that in the Age of Fire we aren't on top and might be mistreated due to our lack of strength, or do we take the risk and see what the Age of Dark is about? One thing to note though is the circumstances regarding these endings. Fram says that the undead curse will be cured if we go with the Age of Fire, and not even Koth says anything about this when we talk with him about it. So does that mean that we'll stay undead, or at least still have the risk of going hollow in the Age of Dark? Furthermore, the Age of Fire was a time ruled by the gods, and they did what they could to keep it that way, but we killed them. 
Everyone in Anor Londo that is a god is either dead or gone. Gwendolyn is the only one that canonically lives thanks to Dark Souls 3. So even though an Age of Fire can be seen as the Age of Gods, that might not be true anymore as we took care of most of them. So there is positives and negatives both ways, and that's really been the point. There's never going to be a clear answer. It's just whatever you think is right. As for me, I think an Age of Dark is the proper way to go. As we said in the intro, the world of Dark Souls is like a set of operations. Things come and things go. And the Age of Dark should have followed after the Age of Fire, but due to Gwyn breaking the rules of the world, that didn't happen. So I think in an attempt to set things back on track before further destruction, an Age of Dark is the way to go. Regardless of what happens in this Age of Dark, at the very least things will transition back to the way it was supposed to be. However, that might not be the actual ending. Given the future titles, some have debated on proper endings, and given the status of Dark Souls 3, linking the flame I think is the real ending and is definitely the most agreed upon, as just about every person in this game will speak about linking the flame. We only hear about the Age of Dark from Koth, who we have to jump through several hoops to just even meet. I can almost guarantee someone has gone throughout the entire game and didn't even know that an Age of Dark was the real option because of how hidden it is. And while it's not my preferred ending, Continuing the Age of Fire would set in motion numerous events for us to discover. Dark Souls 1 was a fantastic experience from start to finish, and while the road was a little bumpy sometimes along the way, its story wrapped up wonderfully. It's a game that I recommend you play at least once in your lifetime as you will never get to experience something like this ever again. But we're just getting started. But now, we've made it to the outro. Thank you all for watching today, and I hope you all enjoyed. If you did, please be sure to like and subscribe if you're new. We still have quite a few Souls games to get through, so get ready as we're going to be going through Dark Souls 2 next. And I must say, I'm honestly quite excited, and I hope you all are too. To wrap things up, as always, thank you to my returning viewers for coming back to another video, and take care everyone. Goodbye.